Welcome back for our closing keynote session. And before I welcome Provost Dirk, I would just like to take a moment to thank some people who worked extremely hard uh, to put this conference together really over the past year. We start a year in advance. Um, you're gonna see more evidence of that at the end of this session. Um, and um, first of all, do we have, oh, there we go. Uh, in your program, you'll see the members of this year's organizing committee responsible for the program. Thank you to Vanessa Grout, Jerry Hollow, Kim Hoover, Albert Jane, Jay Masterman, and an extra special thanks to Manny Dizaraga sitting down in the first row next to the provost. Um, great job. I mean, this is, a, this is a lot of effort by these people. We really appreciate them. <laughs> Not in your program. I think I have control. There we go. Not in your program is a big group, a much bigger group of UM team members, including all of the people you see listed on here. I, originally I was gonna go through all the names, I realized I don't have quite that much time, but these are team members from the School of Architecture, from the School of Business, from the law school, uh, from facilities, uh, from you know all of the people who helped us figure out parking for today. Um, we had like 30 meetings on parking, I think. Um, anyway, we hope that you've had a good experience. Did you have a good experience today? Good visit? Great. Um, would like to do it again uh, sometime. Uh, so uh, thank you and a round of applause for this team. Thank you to all of our team members, our volunteers who are here today to help. All right, it's now my pleasure to welcome the Executive Vice President for Academic Affairs and University of Miami Provost, Jeffrey L. Dirk, who will introduce our closing keynote session. Provost Dirk is UM's chief academic officer with appointing oversight authority concerning deans, where's my dean, behave yourself right there, uh, of the 11 schools and colleges, as well as senior administrators involved with research, undergraduate and graduate education, libraries, and academic areas. I think that covers everything and everyone in the university, so behave yourselves. Provost Dirk is the, also a former dean himself of the School of Engineering at Case Western University, Reserve University, an accomplished engineer and scientist, as well as a respected academic with a deep appreciation for the social sciences, the arts, and the humanities. Throughout his distinguished career, he has promoted many interdisciplinary research and educational initiatives, including what we do here with all three real estate programs, a leading expert in biomedical engineering I'm sorry, imaging, especially magnetic resonance imaging, MRI. He holds more than 40 patents and has been awarded numerous NIH and industry-sponsored grants. I joked with him uh, just now that he's, he will be the second person on stage today with more than 40 patents, the other one being Amit Haller from Veeve. In 2017, he was inducted as a fellow into the National Academy of Inventors, which recognizes academic achievement, innovation, and scientific discovery. Please welcome Provost Jeffrey Dirk. You don't know how much it means to a provost to get a round of applause, so thank you very much. And thanks, Chuck, for the introduction. So today's closing keynote session brings us back to this year's theme of Miami's rapid evolution as a global entrepreneurial and tech-friendly city. At UM, we're not only happy to be hosting all of you today, to be, but also to be part of that revolution. Now the COVID-19 pandemic accelerated the pace of change and triggered reconstruction of how we conduct virtually every aspect of our daily lives. The pandemic challenged us and challenged our long-standing assumptions and required rapid adaptation of businesses, municipalities, and even universities. And it fueled a wave of rethinking and innovation in every sector of the real estate industry. Our keynote speakers include Sandeep Matrani, the CEO of WeWorks, a pathbreaking company that anticipated the evolution of work that's now accelerated by the ap uh, pandemic. And Arnaud Carcenti, the managing principal of 13 Floor Investments, who is, a, who is a front runner of changes in residential and mixed use communities that respond to how and where we want to live. Sandeep and Arnaud are joined by Francis Suarez, the mayor of the Magic City, the capital of capital, 
also known as the City of Miami. Mayor Suarez is helping navigate the tremendous opportunities and challenges and changes now shaping our lives and the communities we live in, and we're happy to be working with him and others in this trajectory. Our node will lead our discussion this afternoon. In our node, I understand the mayor wanted to start with a discussion of a judo match that you guys had when you were about nine years old. So let's start with that topic and see where the conversation goes. Gentlemen, please come up. Thank you. Thanks so much, Derek. Fantastic. I'll make him sit here. Exactly, perfect. Just imagine. <laughs> the, the, the ghost of Francis Suarez. This is hybrid. Uh, <laughs> It's, it's flexible. Before we begin, um, I'd like to spend 10 seconds just to close our eyes and think about the people in Ukraine right now that are dealing with unbelievable stress and anguish and just spend 10 seconds just thinking about that. Okay, thank you for that. Um, it's a pleasure to be here. Very, very exciting day. It's been great so far and it's uh, really a pleasure and an honor for me to moderate uh, this last keynote. Um, I, first of all, I, let me tell you wh what's not gonna happen. I, I'm not Marcelo Clure. Um, I'm Arno Carsandi, which is similar, but less good looking and successful. Um, <laughs> but I do have with me Sandeep Mathrani, um, who is good looking and successful. And, uh, and I'm going to be joined jo shortly by, uh, by Francis, uh, uh, by Mayor Suarez, who's gonna join us momentarily. So, um, I've gotten to know Sandeep recently, and um, he, he's basically a turnaround artist. Uh, so this, so WeWork represents the third of several uh, large turnaround stories that he's been part of, and it's really, a, we're gonna hear some incredible si insights, not just on WeWork the company and on, on the state of, of its effect on Miami, but also some phenomenal nuggets on how to manage your career, how to manage your life, and what it means to be at various stages of, 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 of your life. Um, so Sandeep, let's start with this. Two years ago, the world changed, um, as we've all heard and all discussed. We witnessed uh, what was an unprecedented pandemic that pretty much questioned the way we all live, the way we work, um, no pun intended, and the way we, we behave. Um, you took over we work, which in of itself was a, in, a, in a state of massive transition and had been in the public eye. Um, how, how, what was going through your mind at the time? So, you know, it actually goes back to uh, October of 2019, um, and there was an implosion of WeWork, as we all know. And, um, and on the outside, I've been a landlord my whole life, and we looked at this company, uh, and we couldn't figure out the valuation, but we liked the concept. And I, and I joked with, you know, now my fiance Liz, and I said, uh, um, you know, uh, I'd love to be CEO of WeWork. So never wish. Sometimes your wishes come true. Um, <laughs> be careful what you wish for. Be careful <clears throat> what you wish for. But that is true, you know, and so when in, uh, in, in, ja in January, when I was, uh, uh, and I, I got the opportunity to become CEO of WeWork, I did it for four, three reasons, really. Um, WeWork is an amazing brand. I mean, the brand is, uh, you know, it, 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 it's, it's got more popularity than Amex, as an example, right? It's got a 61% NPS and Amex has 51% or something like that. So it's very popular brands. So when you think about co-working, you think about Flex, the first name you think about, hey, let's go to WeWork. <laughs> it's, it's not you, it's him. <laughs> we like the hologram of you, by the way. <laughs> we like that you were virtual for a long time. Someone, someone, I don't know if it was on, but someone said it, you didn't look muscular enough. <laughs> um, you want to turn on where it's, uh, it's on? Oh, it I, is on. It's gotta be on, it's on. <laughs> Are you guys? We've already introduced you. We've already covered childhood friendship with the judo matches. We've done it all. We so. heard that you lost. Yes. Exactly. No, no. <laughs> everyone knows Arno as the judo guy. Like I'm walking in, my body man is like, "Isn't that the guy you do judo with?" I'm like, okay, yes. So good. So we've set the stage, basically talking about how obviously a couple years ago, uh, pandemic hit. World. Everybody thought the world was falling apart, and you know there was obviously laws of un unintended consequences and unintended benefits. And like I like to think about who, who would have known, who would have called that all of these changes would benefit Miami. I, I can think of someone who might have thought about it. <laughs> and uh, I can also think of someone who was running a company at the time that was also going through massive transition and Zandi was talking about that. 
So maybe we can, we can get your perspective on where your mind was at two years ago. You know, I don't think that I could have ever imagined that we could have accomplished what we've accomplished in the last uh, 16 months, 18 months. Uh, I, you know, people often talk about, and Sandeep and I have had multiple conversations about this, about sort of Miami as a 10-year overnight success story. You know, it, it, and so many companies are like that. Everybody, there's a saying in, in the churches that they see the glory, but they don't know the real story, right? They think that uh, when you're successful, it just sort of happened. And really, uh, this Miami moment that we've sort of converted into a movement was very intentional, very comprehensive, and there were many people that were involved. And then it had a catalytic moment, right? It had this lightning in a bottle, how can I help tweet? moment that uh, in conjunction with a variety of other macro factors that conspired at the same moment to create what I call a tsunami of opportunity. And most people, uh, when, when confronted with a tsunami, uh, hide or run in the opposite direction or take cover. Well, I got my surfboard out and decided to ride the tsunami wave of opportunity. And I think it's something that's benefited tremendously of this community. We're uh, number one in the nation in tech job growth, number one in tech job migration. We've uh, moved a trillion, three or 400 billion in AUM companies in the last 16 months. Uh, we've grown 200% in venture capital deals completed year over year. We were ranked the happiest city in America, the healthiest city in America, number one in pandemic recovery. Uh, our unemployment rate is 1.4%. Our homicide rate went down by 23% last year. And we had the lowest homeless rate since 2013. So I, I don't know that anybody could have predicted that. Um, I feel very blessed to be able to um, share that information with you all um, and to have been a part of, of helping create that. But it was, a, it was an ecosystem that did it in a collaborative fashion. And uh, as we heard from Sunny, we also apparently have a great ultra scene as well that uh, is stronger than ever. So uh, that's, we forgot that one. But sure. um, if you, if you think about what was it about Miami that would, and maybe Sandy, but it'd be good to get your perspective first. What is it truly about Miami that would, that would create such a catalyst and, and attract so much, so many people, so much wealth, so many businesses in such a short period of time and with so much momentum? I mean, that, that's really the, the feeling that we, we almost as, as, as natives don't understand because never before have we seen so much of this almost like a snowball effect so quickly. What do you think about it? I think it's multiple factors, and I, you know, uh, and I would say this even if the mayor wasn't here. I think it's to create a great political environment. You know, people like to have an environment where policies are good. Uh, and I think if the mayor didn't go out and you know go get tweet happy in a good way, uh, I'm not sure people would really think it seriously. And then you've got to put your put your tweets into real action. And I think it, he's been consistent and persistent about that. And, and so that sort of puts that on the, on the image and says, hey, Miami is no longer just the capital of Latin American companies, mm -hmm. but it can really be a base for US companies. Um, you know, the weather, tax structure, but I also think, you know, it's fundamentally, you know, the, 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 the policies that are being passed here by both the governor and the mayor, by the way, you know, I will give both credit, and the way they handle the pandemic. Uh, was, was, was a little courageous, uh, to be honest with you, and they caught on fast to what people wanted. Uh, and I think you know, when you create a good business environment, a welcoming environment, I'm not talking about the people who just come here for the week or come here because there's a hybrid situation and it works, but how do you move, you know, move companies here? How do you move that kind of, you know, uh, to be created to be a tech? He created the start of something that'll continue for the next decade. So Mayor Suarez, I mean, from your perspective, it seems like a lot of the other mayors around the country, it felt like the pandemic for them was an opportunity to miss an opportunity. Uh, and from your perspective, it was just almost like shooting fish in a barrel. You were like, I'll, I'll take you all. And you had, a, you had a billboard sign in San Francisco that said, DM me. Uh, uh, <laughs> I mean. It actually you, said, if you want to move to Miami, DM me. <laughs> if you want to move to Miami, DM me, exactly. <laughs> not, no, not just DM me in general. It has to be to move to Miami, right, exactly. And so, you know, being in the moment, and I remember watching the Facebook videos of you, uh, because you, you were one of the first people that had COVID at the time, and you walked us through literally the hour by hour, play by play, which was in of itself very, very bold, bold in a gesture. Um, I mean, how, how were you thinking about, about, about seizing that opportunity? Uh, again, I mean, I think, you know, 
we, uh, we as a community, I say we as a community, um, uh, about 10, 12 years ago decided that if we really wanted to be competitive, uh, we had to have a thriving tech ecosystem. Now, it's easy to say, right? Um, very hard to do, and I think uh, there are many people, um, I was one of them, but there were many people that really felt that we needed this sort of ecosystem. So we started building it kind of the way you build a company, basically bootstrapped. I mean, there wasn't major investors in this endeavor. Uh, you know, you had um, uh, the Knight Foundation and Matt Hagman. You had uh, Manny Medina, who had just sold Terramark uh, and had launched the Emerge Americas. You had Nitin over at the DDA, um, who had been an evangelist. And then, uh, you know, you had certain macro things that happened, right? You had the, the salt deduction going away. That made uh, areas of this country that were relatively more expensive than Miami, uh, even more expensive, an additional 13, 14%, depending on the city. Then you had this sort of anti-innovation sentiment where you had a, a councilwoman in San Francisco saying, F Elon Musk, and him responding, message received, and moving <laughs> to Austin. Right? Don't DM me. Yeah, yeah, don't DM me. <laughs> and, and, and in New York, when Amazon chose New York, which I was surprised, frankly, that they were chosen as, as uh, you know, as, as they're, they're one of the prize winning cities for, for headquarter two, 50,000 high paying jobs. And New York said, no thanks. You know, I mean, that is, you know, the craziest thing from my perspective, having been uh, raised by parents that were born, uh, exiled from their country of birth, uh, a communist <laughs> Cuba, I just couldn't imagine uh, living uh, in a country, uh, in a city that wouldn't invite that kind of, uh, you know, that kind of innovation. And, <coughs> then, and, then, uh, and then you had evangelists, so many of them. But one of them was Marcelo, um, who was the one that introduced me to Sandeep. And, uh, you know, Marcelo came in right at the beginning and said, I believe in you, I believe in what you're doing. But it was more than belief. He said, I'm going to put $100 million of SoftBank's money in the Miami, uh, you know, in the Miami sort of an ecosystem. So he put, I mean, imagine as a, as a venture capitalist coming in and saying, we're dedicating $100 million to companies created in your city and capitalized in your city. He, he, he connected me with Sandeep and we did a WeWork initiative uh, for people moving to Miami. Uh, so we had multiple people, but, you know, to Sandeep's point, there had to be a, 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 a focal point, a person who sort of channeled it all and who was sort of the receptacle of it. And I think creating the Cafecito Tech Talks was important for, for me and for the city because it, it helped us build that narrative. And I realized and I learned during COVID when I was doing the videos that people are actually watching, <laughs> you know, that they actually are interested in, in a, a different content. And, uh, and so that, that's what inspired me to do the Cafecito Tech Talks, which I think we've done over 200 of them and had you know, thousands and thousands of views. So first of all, I believe in Miami too, and uh, I'm working on the 100 million, it's coming, but you know, yeah. it's just, I'm good for it. Um, actually, it ended, up being, it ended up being 250. Oh. So you started at 100, start somewhere. and you actually ended up doing 250. So let, let's shift over, so thinking about technology, um, let's think about the workplace for a second, and you know, usually you think about where you work, where you live, as a re relatively similar thing. But this pandemic has somewhat decoupled uh, the living and working in, in, in arrangement. A, a lot having to do with Zoom and technology, but a lot also having to do with the prioritization of where people want to spend their time. WeWork seems to really fill an interesting gap in this model, and it's interesting whether or not it is a temporary gap or is it a mode of life that's here to stay. What's your view on that, Sandeep? Um, I, I'll go on to sit back and say that, you know, the cities where people move to, I think, you know, you listen to the one story, I moved to Salt Lake City and I'm in Deer Valley and I'm working. Yeah, those are five people. But let's talk about, you know, where people are actually moving at scale, right? And we'll talk about WeWork in a second, is that people like cities. And when, 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 it, when they really left to New York, okay, they moved to Atlanta, they moved to Miami, they moved to Charlotte, they moved to Austin, they moved to Durham. They didn't move to, you know, uh, you know, Schenectady, New York, or, uh, you know, Manhasset, Long Island, or Bridgewater, New Jersey. You know, they actually moved to actual cities, and there's a reason for that. Because still people surround themselves and live around a city. Mm -hmm. So the migration happened, that was already happening, and it was happening for a very different reason. It was a happening for the reason where you chase talent. People have now confused the issue, but these companies, the Googles, the 
the, the Amazons, the, the, you know, the, uh, the, the Facebooks, they're chasing talent. So they're going to towns that have you know, great universities that produce great people. And that's why if you look at the city, why do you think the Bay Area took off? Why do you think Boston took off? It took off because it had great universities. It wasn't, it wasn't an accident. You had good crop of people coming out of universities. And so now what's happened is this migration actually was all about chasing talent. So the aspect of where WeWork comes in, and I would sit back and say WeWork was created you know, for this environment because no one wants permanency. They want flexibility. They want a turnkey solution. They want it now. And I always give this funny story. When I was young, we would all have tailor-made clothes in India when I was 10 years old. And then there was a store that had ready-made garments. And the guy says, we said, oh, the ready-made garment guy's never gonna, never gonna win. He's gonna lose, right? And what happened? The bespoke tailor lost and the ready-made garment won. We're ready-made office, mm -hmm. right? Or we're office in the cloud. So, so what people want is optimization of real estate. And we're perfect for new cities. Like, you know, I will sit back and say almost every tenant that has exploded in Miami first opened in a WeWork. True. Almost every. I'd agree with that. At scale. So Francis, how do, you, how do you see that from your perspective? How do you use the WeWork example as a lure for, for even more businesses to come into Miami? How do you create that positive feedback loop? Well, I think, I think Sandeep is right. I mean, uh, most people who come to Miami don't come signing a 10-year lease, right. right? They come uh, dipping their toe in the water, mm -hmm. if you will. Um, they're feeling the temperature. Uh, determining whether or not there is in fact critical mass, which I think people are surprised at what kind of critical mass there is here. Uh, when, you, when you see the AUM numbers, I think that gives you some, some concept and the VC numbers, that gives you some sense of it. But the world is changing so rapidly, it's so disruptive, and the nature of where you work is probably one of the biggest disruptions, right? So, you know, someone was asking me today about traffic and I think traffic is also disrupted by where you work. So there's all these second order uh, dis disruptions. But I think one of the other things that's happening, and, and, and we work as well positioned for this, but, but it's also a different phenomenon that's even beyond this, beyond that, is the fact that I think my thesis is, to Sandeep's point, is that Miami will be the capital of capital, or the epicenter of capital, because Miami is geo-positioned in the middle of five mega markets, right? New York, Silicon Valley, South America, the Middle East, and Europe. And what I think will happen, uh, and, and so he's right, that we are sort of metamorphosizing beyond our old brand, which is a good brand, being the capital of Latin America, but it's a limiting brand. And I think now we are, we are stretching out in a generational inflection point, and we are now gonna be the in my opinion, the largest aggregator and deployer of capital on the planet. That's what I think we will be. But even though companies will be created and capitalized here, they will create jobs everywhere. Mm. They'll create jobs in Marble, North Carolina. They'll create jobs uh, you know, everywhere in the, in the country. One of our recent unicorns, Papa, um, is 100% remote. So uh, that's another phenomenon that is, is a new phenomenon. But the other thing that's interesting about Miami, we talked about this the other day, is you know we have right now, right now, and this is not a full pipeline, but we have six million square feet of commercial space coming online. I think it's 20 million square feet less than you need. That's right, <laughs> probably, <laughs> probably true. But, uh, but the truth is that we have a ton, and, and our price per square foot is, has never been higher, I mean, I know of multiple buildings, even older buildings, that are breaching the $100 uh, gross price per square foot price point. So, I mean, the health of the ecosystem of the market has never been better than it is at this moment. Right, Alicia? So, you know, it's interesting because you, you get as a question, as a real estate guy, you, 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 the first question investors will ask is, you know, what about supply? You know, what about this? And, and it's interesting when you start to think about what both of you said, there's, there's, there's this thing about critical mass in real estate. You know, you, you know the example, you get off the highway, you go to two diners, one has, is packed with cars and the other one has three people. Which one do you go to? Virtually every human being would go to the one that's packed. And there's this essence of that people wanna be around people. And so when we think about supply, whether it's in multifamily or an office, the reality is people don't wanna be out on an island. 
they want to be part of, a, of an urban construct. Um, so with that said, let me, let me give you a hypothetical. Just imagine for a second, like imagine like someone like me was a real estate developer that maybe wanted to build an office building. Would you recommend that I do it? Do it here? Yeah, would you recommend a re that, that, real, that, that, uh, that, that the developers promote and, and build office buildings? 100%. Because at the end of the day, if you think about it, especially the tech guys, okay, they're still gravitating, have been the biggest users of office space throughout the country. Actually, if you think about all the big cities, they've absorbed and sucked up office space. Okay, they still believe fundamentally in collaboration that's gotta be meaningful and there's gotta be uh, innovation and productivity uh, and, and it's incredibly important. So I actually, I'm not, I wasn't kidding when I said, if I looked at Miami and I've had this conversation with you and with you, Arna, you know, is that the, what's missing here is we don't have big footprint buildings. Okay, so if you really want to attract tech to the next level and you want to bring Google here for 500,000 square feet, where's a 10 story, 50,000 square feet footprint building? It doesn't exist, mm -hmm. right? I know there's a handful under construction, but what the, you know, what the mayor has done is he set the foundation. You need to now grow it for the next eight to 10 years, whether it be infrastructure, schools, fire, police, all the above, but you don't even have, you know, and, and in a funny way, when the rents get this high, it's a negative, not a positive. You can get, you can scare people away. What you don't wanna do is say, let me go to Charlotte, North Carolina for 30 bucks a foot, because some person's gonna sit back and say, you know, that's a big difference, yeah. okay? And so I would sit back and say, what are the- a panic attack. <laughs> so one of the, no, but one of the advantages, think about what Miami was, the rents were 55, 60 bucks a foot. It was reasonable, yeah. okay? So now, what, so now we need to increase the supply yeah. so the, actually the pricing doesn't go out of hand. Well, let, let me just say, if I may, two sure. things. One of them is, I do agree with uh, the central premise of his prior comments, which is there is a renaissance to the urban, the urban environment. Right? I mean, cities are becoming these uh, aggregations of talent and capital, et cetera. Um, the second part is, is, I think, an advantage for Miami, which we've obviously seen this massive amount of demand, which uh, I don't think anybody fully anticipated. We never thought inflation would also be through the roof like it is now. Um, but we, we have not only the six million in our commercial pipeline, which probably should be 10 or 20, uh, but we have 47,000 units in our residential pipeline. So we have, and we have the ability to grow unlike cities like New York and, um, and San Francisco, which have you know, supply restrictions or are built out. We have the ability to grow 10X, 10X. So the delta between what's built in our city and what can be built is a 10 to one multiple. Uh, so that's, uh, that's encouraging uh, for someone who is thinking about what is the future of our city. But again, that goes back to exactly what I was trying to get at. You know, Midtown Miami was affordable. It needs to be affordable. Of course. You know, and then that's the important part. If this really has to become the next, it has to become the next Austin or whatever you want, you know, you, you have to continue that growth. We have to be the next Austin? Austin, <laughs> no, you want to be the next Austin. No, he just means Midtown itself has to become the next Austin. You just want to be the next Austin. <laughs> I want to blow Austin away. But you would, by being the, you know, exactly. that's, that's a good one, I like that. I'm all for that, but you gotta, you know, you gotta really, so, you gotta really, you know, so, take that development to the next so, level. So l let's dig in a little bit to this one. So when you think about an Austin, you think about Miami. I think people love Miami. People love Austin. I think the big thing Austin has is a lot of industry that's set up there, and Miami is in the process right now of recruiting that industry in an unprecedented way. As I think about WeWork, you know, part of me says, well, WeWork comes in. You know, what stops someone else from building an office building next door and maybe? not putting WeWork out of business, but maybe hurting WeWork. Now, as I listen to you, and as I've gotten to know you recently and really understanding the business model, I realize WeWork, the best thing that could happen for WeWork is for other office buildings to be built around it, because WeWork is effectively a leading indicator to businesses coming in. 100%. You basically create an entry ramp for companies to come in, because tomorrow Google comes in, wants the wants headquarters in Miami, you know, they may not start with half a million or a million square feet, but they're gonna start with 50 or 100,000 square feet of WeWork, dip their toe in, if they like it, they'll do it. And they'll probably keep your space anyway, just for flexibility purposes. There's a second part, which is when you're creating the ecosystem that we're creating, which is rapidly growing um, innovative companies, uh, WeWork is essential because they need to be able to expand rapidly. And it, it's hard to expand, it's hard to contract, it's hard to have the flexibility. Um, you just can't do that in the normal commercial context. So it's very good for an ecosystem like ours. Like 
you know, it's interesting because I'm do mostly residential. And, you know, when you do these amenities, in the past you would put these business centers together and it was basically a ghost town. It was like a little card room that no one would use and you just would check the box. Today, these business centers are packed, they're jammed. And so they want more and more business centers. And so in some of the buildings we're doing, instead of doing 1,000 feet, it's 5,000 feet. In some cases, 10,000, 20,000 feet. Then I scratch my head and I say, wait, hold on. I'm not in your business. <laughs> it's not my business is to rent your office. So it reached an inflection point where multi and, re and multifamily apartments, condos, and and we work in office start to blend, which is in and of itself really interesting. And, and, and so it's interesting how this kind of co-working, co-living concepts are all, are all blending together. How do you think about that, Sandeep, as you guys look to sign more, more leases, enter new en markets with different products? Thank you. One, I would sort of sit back and say, just to put it in perspective, we finally come to the inflection point whereby now a tenant will ask if there is a WeWork in the building. Mm. Because what's happened is, if they're growth companies, they wanna make sure they can grow flex up and flex down. Then you have an optimization theory, right? So if you basically, today are generally at 1.8 or so people per desk, okay? But now what if this, everyone decides to come in, what do you do? You can just rent a conference room, you can rent 10 offices, you can take space temporarily. So that flex space is now, which was meant to be the real amenity, is now a necessity, mm -hmm. which was a nice to have, is a must have, right? So effectively, what's happened is flex has become, flexes to office was e-commerce was to retail 20 years ago. Mm -hmm. It's a separate channel of distribution. Like we are here and now, okay, uh, and effectively, you know, an office is 12 to 18 months out because you gotta plan for it, nothing wrong with it, and, and you need both, right? It's so all our tenants that basically were at Brickle or Southeast Financial, they've either gone and bought buildings or they're growing within, our, within the same building we're in, right? All of them mm -hmm. uh, at scale. And, and so now when you combine that with co-living, I think it's important, okay? But I think it's, an, it's a true amenity. I don't know whether it grows to the way Flex has grown and, it's, and the Flex is about two and a half percent of the business. It's, they think it's gonna be 20% of the business by the end of the decade. Uh, and actually the UK is well ahead of the US. Uh, it's already at 6% in London, uh, and, and one of the biggest developers in London said 20% of his portfolio is gonna be flex. So effectively, I, I do think it has, still happens in the districts, but I think when it's associated, to, when I say in a, in a building that has living, okay, it depends on what scale. I just came back from Toronto on Wednesday. Well, it's at scale. The office was 100,000 feet, and there were 200 apartments above. Mm -hmm. Different story. Okay, it's not that it's really an amenity, it's really true co-living. And then that's the, we took about half that space and we're doing really well. Also, when I, I can tell you, when I go on vacation, my wife says I need a Starbucks and a WeWork or else she's not gonna go. Just the I'll Starbucks. I'll send you part. an all access card. <laughs> exactly. So, no, but I, but I hear you, it is, it, it's becoming an amenity for, for sure. So uh, just with the time we have left, I, I'd actually like to transition a bit to, to, we have, most of the audience is actually students and, and you talk about recruiting talent, you talk about what Miami really needs more of is, is just m more students, more, the University of Miami's done such a great job, but it's one of three or four institutions down here. Um, you know, Sandy, you and I were talking earlier about your view on careers, your view on students, and you had some notes to give, and I know, Mayor, you have some as well. It'd be great for, to get your thoughts, both of your thoughts, on what advice you would give the students in the audience in terms of seeing all this excitement, seeing all this great momentum that we have. How, how should they be thinking about managing their careers uh, in, in, with, with this? I'll just give you a few things that have worked, you know, you know for me. Uh, one is you, you gotta do something that you love to do, and then there, several stages in a person's life, uh, and I think I said it, you know, early, middle, and late, and you said it 20, 30s, and 40s, so I think we're saying the same thing, is, you know, early in your career, uh, it's about finding the passion, finding what you like to do, finding, you know, and pivoting. When I use the word pivoting, don't be afraid to move to different jobs within an organization. So don't focus on money. Focus on your career and how you're gonna advance. Then you get to that middle stage of life where you get you know, married, have a child, have a home, and now you have to juggle both. Um, and, and, and hopefully by that time, you found a career path that, that, that works for you. And then there's sort of this later part, you know, part in life where you sort of give back. And, and so you have to know where you stand and how you get from A to B. And I will say, like I was an engineer, uh, still an engineer, never stopped being one, but and I, and I got into real estate in a very interesting way, and I'm not gonna bore you with the story, 
But when I got into real estate, I got in as an engineer. Then the next day I became the guy who was doing facilities management. The next day I became a guy who was, and li literally for the first three years, I think I made less money than I started. Because every job I took was actually paying you less because I, I didn't have my head on right, right? I was, and I was happy for that because when I finished, I said, you know, I want to lead a company. And I had the ingredients. I had had the experiences. I'd done it myself. I rolled up my sleeves. And I think people forget that. And we get stuck in our, in our uh, you, know, in, in a, you know, in a certain path. And you can't deviate from that path. So my only advice to kids is just a, a know where you are in that career path. But don't be afraid to try. So the takeaway there is uh, for all the students is to do what you love. Don't worry about the money, even if you have to work for free. So anybody here wants to come and work for 13th floor, <laughs> by all means, it's fine. No problem. We, you know, we pay very well free. Uh, <laughs> uh, but no, it's, in all seriousness, it, it, it's true, right? People can, are always thinking about the end goal, that they lose sight of the, of, the, of, the, of the passage to get there, the journey itself. And the journey is actually the most fun part to begin with. Uh, Mayor Suarez, what do you think? I don't remember in judo you being this funny. <laughs> um, it's because I was on the mat. That's right. That's right. <laughs> Under your foot. <laughs> uh, so what I think is, is I, I'll, I'll sort of play off a little bit of what Sandeep said, which is there's a difference between money and value, mm -hmm. right? Sometimes something that pays less is creating more value for you. And so it ends up having a good ROI, right? Uh, off, honestly, working in government, I'm not like pitching my office, but working in government. It's free. Yeah. <laughs> it creates a lot of value. So I've, I've had many employees in the history of my 12 years of public service that have taken pay cuts to work with me, left, and made 4x, 5x, 10x what they were making with me uh, working in a private company with a tremendous amount of experience understanding that they also were mission driven, right? And I think a lot of organizations, small companies, big companies are mission driven, right? And I think that th when you're working in government or when you're working in a value-based environment as opposed to a financial environment, you're focusing on the mission, you're focusing on the goal, you're not focusing so much on your specific ROI, but you're creating a lot of ROI for yourself. So that would be lesson number one. Lesson number two is, is, is embrace the disruption, right? We are living in a disruptive world and the rate of disruption is going to grow continually and exponentially. And I think uh, sometimes our educational institutions do a good job, sometimes they don't do as good of a job at, at uh, preparing you for that disruption. But understand that whether you're prepared in the, in the educational sense or not, it's coming. So what, what do I, what, how do I sort of unpack that a little bit? One is, I actually think Sandeep's background is a great one, which is engineering. Right, because it gives you a tremendous. There's Alice's back there, is looking at me like, yeah, I'm an engineer too. You know, my dad's an engineer, my sister's an engineer. Um, engineering is important because it's it's at, at its core, it's a problem solving, uh, uh, you know, discipline. Uh, finance uh, as well, but then understanding that the, even though some of the harder uh, skills are needed, the softer skills are also needed. Sales, marketing, you know what I mean. So we we had a recently a. Um, a job fair where we had 2,400 high paying jobs available and we only had 350 people that came, right? And, and, and I, as I contemplated, well, where were the other 1,900, you know? Um, I realized that maybe some of them were intimidated and thought these are only tech jobs. And the truth is that a tech company like WeWork, uh, which every company nowadays is essentially a tech company, even a real estate company has become like a tech company. They need all kinds of services. They don't only need hard, you know, uh, computer engineers. They need, you know, marketing people and salespeople and accountants and lawyers, and they, 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 that's how you create a company that can, that can execute on a vision, which is essentially what the CEO is charged with doing. That's very insightful. You know, it's interesting, the, the, the head of our kids' school has a saying that she's tasked with the job of training, uh, of educating student kids for jobs that don't yet exist in the future. They don't, they don't, they're not created, we don't even know what they're gonna be and yet you have to form people now. Uh, and I think we're right now in the middle of an enormous amount of change and, oh, and disruption. Um, I, I, I'd like to just add, my, my perspective on this is that um, th there's no greater return than on people at the end of the day. You know, buildings, technology, uh, you know, uh, new, new disruptions, finance. Th yes, you can make money doing all those things, but you'll never make more from a return of a value, especially if you start adding it from a value, not just a money perspective. There's no greater return on, on people. 
Um, and so I hope that the audience realizes that, and especially the students who, who are thinking about their next move. It's more about who you're working with, you know, who you're surrounding yourself with, um, and, and the kinds of how you can learn from others. I've learned a lot today. I hope you have as well. It's been an incredible honor to have both of you up here. It's been awesome. And let's all enjoy some. Thanks, man. So fun. Good.